in a developing story tonight. Hundreds of anti-war activists have rallied in Tel Aviv to warn the authorities against a potential attack on Iran. The Israeli government's leading strike calls over Tehran's nuclear program. Campaigners fear that mounting pressure could escalate into all-out war, the effects of which would reverberate globally. Artis Paula Sleer has been caught up in the protest. This is the first demonstration of its kind, and it comes after months of increasing war rhetoric by the Israeli leadership. What protesters here are saying is that the Israeli Prime Minister has his own election campaign at heart, and that is what is motivating him. It is a opportunistic way to increase his popularity. And the other one is that he is sincerely believing that he has a, a historical appointment and mission to uh, destroy the, the Iranian nuclear program. He has made himself totally crazy in this direction. A recent poll suggested that some 58% of Israelis are against a military strike. Now, the momentum for this demonstration began about a week ago when an Israeli couple launched a campaign online in which they posted messages of support and love for Iranians. Ordinary Iranians responded with their own messages. So if you look at Facebook and other social network sites, you'll see messages like Israel loves Iran, we are not at war with your country, and Iranians saying we love Israel, we are not at war with anyone. Demonstrators I've been talking to say that this call by the Israeli leadership is irresponsible. It will lead to large numbers of people being injured and hurt, and it's not clear how or when any kind of military strike with Iran will end. But whether or not the Israeli government will listen to the voice on the street remains to be seen. Situation in Syria. I'm joined from Washington by Webster Griffin Tarpley, author and historian. Welcome to the program, sir. Uh, Dr. Tapley, first of all, I mean, Syria has agreed to a peace plan by Kofi Annan, but how much does it correspond to the crisis in Syria? James Corbett's an independent journalist. He's written extensively about the Middle East. He told us he believes President Assad's acceptance of Annan's peace plan doesn't fit the image that's been drawn up by the opposition of his regime. This doesn't really play into the narrative that's been being attempted to be created. It wants to portray Assad as some sort of insane agent who, who can't be reasoned with. But of course, if he is agreeing to this, this process, that doesn't go along with the narrative. And I think that's exactly why you're seeing right now these types of unconfirmed reports coming out about uh, skirmishes along the border and supposedly Syrian troops crossing into Lebanon at the exact same time as this deal is being announced. So that every report that's being picked up around the world right now is mentioning that the uh, that Assad has agreed to this Anon plan, but also that uh, the Syrian uh, troops are crossing into the Lebanon, uh, Lebanese border, which, uh, again, is just an attempt to make it seem like uh, Assad is completely unreasonable and won't, uh, won't be able to, to uh, come to the table in any event, which, of course, will only further uh, perpetuate this, this, uh, this type of destabilization that's going on. The situation in Syria. I'm joined from Washington by Webster Griffin Tarpley, author and historian. Welcome to the program, sir. Uh, Dr. Tarpley, first of all, I mean, Syria has agreed to a peace plan by Kofi Annan, but how much does it correspond to the crisis in Syria? Well, the, the problem with the peace plan is that it fails to recognize that the origin of the problem are these uh, foreign death squads, NATO-backed death squads that have been introduced into the country over the last year or more. And, of course, they have gathered a certain am amount of... Uh, indigenous population, people with various grievances against the regime. But uh, therefore, uh, we, we can't imagine that there's anybody to negotiate with. And this, this I think, is the, is the problem. Who, who can uh, Assad actually negotiate with? Now, looming ominously behind all of this is what's coming on Sunday is this conference of the so-called Friends of Syria, this time in Istanbul, after the failure of the one in Tunisia. They're now attempting it for a second time, and they're, they're trying to make sure that this one doesn't fail in the, the way that the previous one did. Uh, we're reading all about this in the columns of Al-Akbar of uh, Beirut. Uh, what is planned is this buffer zone, in other words, that the Turkish armed forces, or gendarmerie, will seize a part of northern Syria and make that into a safe haven for these death squads so that they can regroup and continue their, their attacks into Syria. Uh, you, you look at this uh, Istanbul conference, on the surface it looks like a coalition of the willing, as we had in the previous decade, 10 years ago, to attack Iraq. 
This one looks more and more like the Munich Conference of September 1938, the one with Hitler, Mussolini, Chamberlain, and Daladier. In those days, the goal was to carve Czechoslovakia. Today, it's Syria. In those days, the buffer zone was called the Sudetenland. Today, it's called the northern area around Idlib. Uh, Russia was not invited to that one. Russia will not be invited uh, to this one. The uh, people in, in Turkey are now very unhappy with Erdogan. I think uh, Prime Minister Erdogan is very much on the hot seat uh, because of his uh, very, very bungling uh, administration of this crisis. According to the Turkish press, Erdogan had been conned by Obama, in effect. Erdogan had been told by Obama in those phone calls that we hear so much about, right, that Obama is constantly on the phone to Erdogan. Obama had convinced Erdogan that the Syrian government of Assad, the Ba'ath Party, was about to fall, and that several months ago. Now, that has not happened. There's a growing awareness in the Turkish parties, in the uh, CHP party, and also in other parties, that Assad is not about to fall. And therefore, Erdogan has crawled all the way out on a limb as a result of this, of this foolish decision. We Hello, everyone. Welcome to Global Government News. Today is Wednesday, March 28th, 2012, and I'm Darko. My website is ggnonline.com. That's ggnonline.com. And on YouTube, my channel is ddarko2012 and ddarko2013. All the headlines and links will be posted in YouTube's video description. All right, I'm ready. Here, Israeli spies step up missions into Iran seeking proof of nuclear plans. The Sunday Times reports that Israeli special forces uh, clad in Iranian uniforms infiltrate regularly from uh, base in northern Iraq. This is interesting, too, because that's Kur pretty much Kurdistan. We're going to get to that uh, news coming up here. Israeli mercenary uh, trained par paramilitary with approval of Colombian authorities. It's uh, he arrived in Colombia under the impression that he would be training, uh, quote, peasants who wanted to confront guerrillas, end quote, he said in the interview. And he goes on, he says, that happened with the approval of the Colombian authorities. And after 10 years, it was concluded that I had done something wrong. He was involved in the 89 guns for Antigua scandal, which Israeli made arms were shipped through Antigua to the Mandolin cartel in Colombia. And it goes on and it says that the mercenaries suspected of training the death squads of the AUC paramilitary uh, group as well as militias working for Pablo Escobar's infamous Medellin drug cartel. Pentagon to seek additional Iron Dome funding, U.S. officials say. Statement by the DOD spokesman comes after U.S. officials initiate Iron Dome Support Act meant to allow purchase of additional anti-missile systems. Uh, this bill that was posted by Mr. Berman, a U.S. representative, authorized U.S. Bar uh, President Barack Obama to provide assistance. It goes on here and it says um, it's a large amount of aid uh, that's been requested by the Israeli government to procure additional Iron Dome systems. Moving on here, we have U.S. anti-Israeli activists to boycott Israeli products. So anti-Israeli activists in Brooklyn, uh, New York City are holding votes on a proposal to boycott Israeli-made products and a bid to put pressure on Israeli regime to cease violations of Palestinian rights. Then you have Israeli group adds a softer voice to debate on Iran, and it says not all American Jews support a military strike on Iran, either by Israel uh, nor by the United States. As part of an effort to convince lawmakers that supporting Israel does not mean agreeing with everything advocated by the country's neoconservative prime minister, Netanyahu. Moving on here, we have U.S. envoy claims Iran helps Yemeni rebels. So here we go. Uh, it says the U.S. ambassador to Yemen has accused Iran of trying to destabilize Yemen by supporting separatists and fighters in the south and north of the country. The U.S. ambassador's accusations against Iran come at the time when uh, Feierstein uh, himself faces growing public calls to leave Yemen. They accuse him of being actually in charge in Yemen and of working to transfer power from unpopular deposed Yemeni dictator Salih to his vice president uh, in a single candidate vote also backed by Saudi Arabia. Yemenis see this contrary to their demands for real democracy accusing the U.S. ambassador of returning a dictatorship to their country and they might be right so we're hearing this rhetoric right malnutrition increasing in some parts of Yemen so the United Nations says there's malnutrition going on in Yemen uh, the Yemenis are staging anti-regime protests 
Uh, basically, they're saying that there's still remnants of the old regime. So once you start hearing stuff like this about uh, oh, Iran's helping Yemeni uh, terrorists and there's malnutrition, usually that comes the no-fly zone, the buffer zone, the killing of people, civilians, humanitarian aid, and stuff like that. Basically, regime change. So Yemeni soldiers rebel against General Ali. And it says here that there's a report on Wednesday morning that hundreds of soldiers under the direct command of Ali uh, took to the streets demanding the Yemen's former army strongman be put on trial and demoted from his post. Most grievances are directly linked, linked to what soldiers and officers alike call widespread and chronic corruption. Then we have Saudi uh, deputy consul kidnapped in southern Yemen. Well, I wonder why, right? We just uh, covered that. So like we saw in that first video, Syria accepts a non-peace plan, but... Uh, you know, like Tarpley said, what what's that going to really do? Who's he going to talk to? Is no one to talk to? And it's it, the big problem is the uh, the terrorists, the foreigners coming in, foreign intervention, uh, coming in there, uh, blowing stuff up, and that. So I mean, how are they going to handle that? Then we have Turkey suspends embassy activities in Damascus, Syria. Turkish official says they suspended the activities of its embassy in Syria. Um, a Turkish official says. Moving on here, we have Turkey edges near to buffer zone for Syrians. So it says events are pushing Turkey ever closer to setting up a buffer zone and Syria to protect civilians. A safe zone would necessarily involve Turkish security forces and involve the potential for clashes with neighboring Syrian troops. The last time they did this was in 91. They set up a buffer zone with hundreds of thousands of Kurd refugees flooding over the border from the Iraq um, and U.S.-led conflict. More than 1,000 Syrians flee to Jordan. Then we have camps in Turkey provide shelter for Syrian refugees. And this is important because what? Remember, I reported on this article setting the precedent NATO may use R2P to intervene in Syria. And it says here uh, that the civilian protest movement triggers a massive humanitarian crisis, forcing millions of uh, refugee, refugees to flee to Turkey's southern border. If they do that, some analysis uh, claim that this would cons uh, potentially constitute an Article 5 situation which could lead Ankara to call for a NATO collective defense initiative. So Russia and China aren't for it. It says the UN isn't for it, but it says NATO's right to collective defense does not require the UN to pass a res resolution authorizing such an intervention. So there you go. That's where they're going to set up their little no-fly zone, launch drones into uh, Damascus, whatever, and then they'll be allowing the terrorists to come in just like in Libya from the east. It says U.S. Turkey agreed to send aid to rebel in Syria. They're going to help with non-lethal aid. On the 24th of February, Tunisia hosted the Friends of Syria meeting, which the Saudi Arabian foreign minister uh, described arming Syrian rebels as, quote, an excellent idea because they have to protect themselves, end quote. Syria rebels form death squad behead army soldiers, says a report. As of last summer, he is quoted as saying they have executed 150 men, also quoted as saying, but I do not know why killing is not difficult for me. Hussein is one of the rebels fighting the government of President al-Assad. This report was posted in Spiegel Online. It says here, armed groups kill Syrian generals, so uh, more terrorists killing uh, Syrian government officials. It says here, shots fired towards Assad during visit to embattled city of Homs. So there was an alleged assassination attempt on the president. Turkish party warns of plot to disintegrate Syria. Senior Turkish politicians warn that Turkey's move against Syria could pave the way for disintegration of Syria with the establishment of a Kurdish autonomous region in the country. Iraq Kurd leader hints at referendum and swipe at Baghdad, basically talking about break on, breaking away. The comments could be seen as a veiled code for seeking independence since most Kurds say they would vote to succeed from Iraq if given a choice. India and the Balkans package, Turkey prepares for a partition of Iraq. And it says Turkey is concerned about the Kurds, especially the PKK, if they decide to take over Syria. So it'll be in three parts, Shia Stan, Kurdistan, and Iraq. Kurds say they will end uh, oil exports if the country, the government, central government, does not hand over promised funds, which regional authorities say have been withheld for more than a year. Leader of Mali military coup is trained in the United States. Leader of Mali coup received officer training from AFRICOM. It says here that the French killer visited Israel. Authorities uh, claimed and it also re being reported that he was an informant for the intelligence services. So it looks like a false flag for sure. U.S. pays Afghans $50,000 per shooting death over the lone gunman, right? And then remember this from Pakistan. The CIA man who killed two Pakistanis, they didn't want money. They didn't want money. They called it blood money. They said 
And it says here, Pakistan rejects U.S. offer on drones. They're going to include advance notice when they're going to kill Pakistani citizens. And even though 70% of Americans want uh, Afghan war to be over, Leon Panetta dismisses it and basically says, go to the devil. I don't give up what you say, America. Just like in Libya, where 70 were recently killed after the intervention, 6 in 10 Americans were against the war. But it doesn't really matter.